So in the previous sections, we've acquainted ourselves with the Wenzetert-Zernike theorem, which is really the fundamental brick at the heart of interferometry that we use to relate the observables of interferometry to the objects we are observed we are observing with that technique. Let's um, simplify a bit our notations here and simply write that the mutual coherence function gamma, which is a function of the UV coordinates, relates to the intensity map that describes the target, which is a function of uh, pointing coordinates on sky, related, and the two operations are, the two quantities are related to each other via an operator called the Fourier transform. Now you notice here that I'm using the letter I uh, simply because it happens to match the first letter of the uh, word intensity because the, the I is really an intensity map. But if I, were to be con if I wanted to be consistent with the notations I've used, for example, in the context of uh, conventional imaging with a telescope, uh, I would have to modify my notations because uh, I is typically the letter you use to uh, describe an image. And I in this context is not an image of the target, but a function that directly describes the object itself. And so to be consistent with these uh, imaging notations, let me just for the moment be um, rename that function I into O, a function that describes the object. You'll see that there, I have a very good reason for doing this in just a few minutes. That vencider zernike relation uh, allows you to compute the mutual coherence function for the entire uh, UV plane, all of the possible locations in the, the space of UV coordinates. Um, let's look at uh, this example here of a spiral looking target. And uh, trust me, there are objects that actually look like this uh, up in the sky. And we are simply using the, the, the Zernike theorem to compute the modulus as well as the phase associated uh, to this object as a function of the U and the V coordinates. You get these maps, the Fourier transform modulus, here taken to the power sort of 0.1 so that the fainter structures are actually visible. And um, the, the Fourier transform, um, the phase part of the Fourier transform here. Now, of course, the astronomer is in the, is in the backward situation where he's um, provided with information in that plane, that would be the coherence measurements, and somehow uses them to go back to a description of the object using the Vensitter Zernike theorem and an inverse Fourier transform relation. So the way you write this is simply, again, a direct translation of the Zernike theorem. Gamma is f of O, where f is the Fourier transform. You want to invert that relationship. One catch is that, unfortunately, one rarely gets access to all of the possible UV coordinates. Uh, the UV plane is as big as you want it to be. Its extent is actually infinite. Um, and we never get access to the entire uh, UV plane, but only to a sample of it. And the sample is entirely defined by the location of the observing stations at, uh, that we are using to do the interferometry. So in the case of a two aperture interferometer, for example, of the entire UV plane, if we're just doing one single observation at one point in time, uh, we're only going to sample that plane in one point only. Here and here in phase. You see a second spot here, but happens to be um, a copy of the original one. Uh, that Those two points are actually essentially the same. The effect of this on our equation is that <clears throat> we're actually not measuring all of gamma, we're actually sampling gamma, multiplying the theoretical gamma 
by a sampling function, which is a function of u and v. Now the shape of that function um, turns out to be given by um, some operation called the autocorrelation of the map of uh, of the map that describes the location of the observing stations. Um, if we have a 2D array and um, and therefore a 2D map describing the location of the stations, the, the, the this autocorrelation operation looks something like this, where we just have um, the pupil, uh, the pupil map, P stands for pupil here. Um, that's uh, cross-correlated with a copy of itself, uh, where we added uh, u and v degrees of freedom. Now, maybe not trivial to uh, understand by simply looking at numbers. Let's look at a couple examples. The first example would be uh, the one of a three interferometer uh, three baseline uh, interferometer, so three apertures. The uh, result of this autocorrelation operation on this array looks something like this. You will recognize that uh, this triangular pattern here that uh, is uh, our aperture is uh, you can find it several times in that autocorrelation here here and here. In fact, you find it three times. So for a three aperture uh, interferometer, you're not going to sample in, in many, but just three places in the UV plane. Like in the 2D, uh, the two aperture case, those uh, um, points here simply happens to be uh, contain the same information as uh, the ones in uh, in the opposite uh, location of the UV plane. The UV plane is um, symmetric or anti-symmetric if you think about phase. If you add a fourth aperture, then the autocorrelation gets more complicated. You, you end up with, uh, with more points in this space, but uh, still the, the math holds. Now, you can use one uh, additional trick Something is called the wiener kinchin theorem that relates that uh, autocorrelation function to something that unexpectedly happens to be the Fourier transform of the instantaneous point spread function uh, R. R, uh, in our previous notation in the context of imaging, was the response of our system that such an array uh, with a pupil P would produce. If you look at the equation, it simply comes down to the sampling function of the UV plane S happens to be, like we define it here, the autocorrelation of the pupil. And that wiener kinchin theorem allows us to say that this autocorrelation is the Fourier transform of the uh, response function of our equivalent array. What are the consequences of this? Actually, pretty interesting. You can rewrite and combine all of that information. Uh, you can rewrite the equation for the uh, Van Zetter-Zernicke theorem, the um, mutual coherence, the Fourier transform of the object function, and the sampling function here, and explicit the content of that sampling function. You can also, uh, what you can do is uh, take the inverse Fourier transform of the entire expression. <clears throat> and here I provide you with all of the steps that allow you to go from one, uh, the first step to the final result. You get the Fourier transform of the product here, turns out to be the product of convolution of the two inverse Fourier transforms. The Fourier transform inverse of a Fourier transform happens to be the identity function. So here, um, this term here simplifies back to be the object function. And here, the inverse Fourier transform of um, the sampling function 
thanks to the Wiener uh, Kitchen theorem, happens to be the response function of our interferometer. Now you have something that must look familiar if you remember the relationship of um, image object in the context of uh, direct imaging with a, with a telescope. And in fact, you can go in and reinterpret entirely the Vensi-Zernike theorem in saying that this form here, which is the Vensi-Zernike theorem, and the image object convolution relation that we use in uh, direct imaging with a telescope happen to be the uh, two sides of the same coin, 